When you give up food as the comfort, what do you think you've replaced it with? Okay. Welcome back to American Tradition, a journey of breaking carb addiction. Last week, we broke down the keto journey in a step-by-step -step process. And this week, we are reminded why. We revisit why Michelle is doing this. She started the journey wanting her clothes to fit better. Today, her motivation moves far beyond her wardrobe and closer to her heart. That's so true. If you had to tell me that this story was gonna be about my family when I started, I wouldn't have believed you. But after living years with the common American traditions of carb addiction, it was clear to me that I needed to do this for more than just myself. Yes. Stick around to the end where I tell Michelle to consume more salt for her high blood pressure. Well, I think that's big, breaking the cycle. That's what you're doing. That was that moment that I said, that's what addiction looks like. To be able to just to say, okay, it's in his diet and we may not even need to visit for medicine, that was huge. When anybody comes into the ketogenic journey, uh, you see me put a lot of focus on that's those steps before they start cutting carbs. I want them to count some carbs before they ever deny themselves because they're kind of crabby those first few days and counting carbs with a new app is never a good combination. Um, I ask them to, uh, you know, sweep out their, even, you know, sweep out their pantries and that's always this moment as well. I don't let them go focus on grocery shopping yet. I'm trying to do all this prep work. And one of the biggest parts of prep work is to unpack someone's why. Why are you doing this? And we did a pretty good job of that the first week. Can you reflect on how you chose your why and whether where that fits into today's motivation and if that's changed? Sure. Um, I think just like with life, your why kind of changes as you go along. And some things that you couldn't see at the beginning become very clear right. as you're going through this process. So one thing that you helped teach me was ask for help. Ask your family for help. You know, hey, I need you to help me do this. So when I was first out here, it was just Jace and I, mm -hmm. just the two of us. And so that's kind of how I got him involved was, you know, more for, I need your help. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize what, how much help he needed in turn and how, how well he was going to do through this whole process and how his response was going to be because you know, as Jesse and I had been watching Jace, you know, start to hit, you know, growing in puberty and we're like, okay, his attention to detail and, and his ability to focus mm. is even lessening. And so we had actually even talked about possibly, you know, medication, not ever really thinking, okay, well, let's first visit what's he putting in his body because, right. you know, it's just what he was eating what we were eating and we could focus, right? Or at least we thought we could. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, um, so with Jace being here and him helping me, in turn, helped me see how much help he needed as well. He mm -hmm. just didn't know how to ask. Right. He didn't know what the issue was, uh -huh. right? So with watching that kind of grow in the first couple of weeks and then watching him calm down and him even realizing it and even people who've been around Jace being like, whoa, can tell a big difference. It, that, that spoke to me volumes. Oh, that's like a mother's gift gift with a ribbon on top. Like. Yeah. To be able to just to say, okay, it's in his diet and we may not even need to, you know, visit, you know, for for medicine for for from a physician. Right. Um so that was huge. You know, so what a gift for just having the ability to reflect and look at his story. Um, but also connecting it to the first step into that whole hidden universe was your vulnerable moment to say, I'm the mom, I know how to do this, I'm fine, and then saying, I'm not, and I need your help. And it's a, I think it was an honest moment, because I, I think one of the worst parts about having teenagers is anytime you've kind of manipulated them into doing things in the past, teenagers come and they can, they can smell it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> But I also think the tenderness of when it's genuine, you get a you get an attraction that you could have never even squeezed out of a, a child in primary school. You know, the younger years. That maturity says, "Oh, this there's something here I'm supposed to do." And that sense of timing for his arrival at helping you, 
it was part in part because you asked. Yeah, well, that's true. Yeah. And that was the hard part. Right. Yeah. Every strong firstborn woman would say that too. Like, <laughs> yeah. I don't need help. Yeah, no, I'm good. I'm good. good. Nothing. Yeah. So one draw to to this for, for myself and for like the ripple effect is what I would call yeah. it. Um, my brother came out and he started the keto and he kind of played around before with the ketogenic diet kind mm -hmm. of like I had and he got out of here and he got a little more serious and he he was like, Oh, I can tell a difference in you and you look better. And so he's gone home and he's continued that journey and you know, I, we try to stay in contact at least once or twice a week. Hey, how you doing? And touch and base. And so far, he's doing well. Mm -hmm. um, so it's encouraging to, to kind of know that people, even far away, are on board. I've got a couple of friends who will text me and say, so how's the fast going? And they don't do keto, but, you know, she's on her own journey. Right. And so she respects the one that I'm taking. Mm, this is such and a big... And she checks in. That's a mature friendship. Take that one and keep it, yes. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how about, like, with the conversations with your mom and dad, how have those been? Um, as far as they, you know, we FaceTimed a little bit and they were like, oh, you look really good. How much have you lost? Those type of questions, you know, um, but trying to really get them on board, they're just not there yet. It's so hard. They're trying to get, um, you know, a cardiac patient to go against what their cardiologist has advised, you know, oh, that's too much fat. She, she can't get over that. Oh, there's the birds. <laughs> ah, that's a blue jay. <laughs> so go back to that. Cause I think originally your mom was a huge part of your why and you'll get to see her here soon for the first time since you've moved to South Dakota it's been a couple months right right so as you from a distance you see you know her she doesn't have an easy path there's medical problems involved there's professionals telling her what to do and as much as you have your professional degree in nursing you're the daughter yes so the the biggest message that you will get to speak, and I can say this from experience, is the one you walk, you're walk. you walking. Mm -hmm. So as you look at where she's stuck, what I mean, if you had to unpack what's the hardest part for somebody with medical problems, even if they have access to you know, pretty well-educated and solid advice, where do you think she's stuck? The high fat. Yeah. She is totally stuck where... If, because you know, for so long it's been you know, fat is bad, fat is bad. Mm -hmm. So and she now with coronary artery disease, mm -hmm. right? Right. You you definitely don't want to add to that. So that's where she's definitely just stuck. Yeah. So what have you tried? What have you tried to tell her? Like as far as getting that message through, just trying to do it over the phone is a little more of a challenge, I think. Mm -hmm. So I've I've really just tried to listen, to, you know, to what she says and. Uh, you got it all prepared for when you go. Huh? I do, yeah. You know, what? Yeah. it'd be so much better just to see her and to be able to sit down and have that moment. Mm -hmm. um, but she had some fruit the other day. And she's like, I just can't believe apples are just that bad. Mm, so yeah. it's it's those things that it's gonna it's gonna take some time. Right. Can you identify some of the things where you're like, this was a tipping point for me? Oh, definitely sugar-free cough drops, the sugar-free gum, even the sugar-free additives that you can put in water to make your water taste good, you know, because who wants plain water, right? right? But it's all those little things that can really add up really quick that you don't even, that you're kind of clueless about, that you're not, you're mindfully doing. Right. I always think of it too, like my kids could get away with that. They could have gum and probably not have any, hardly any notice in their insulin. But they hadn't spent the last 30 years with ramping up a little bit each day, a little bit each day. And so it's almost like the pocket that you get yourself in you can't look around it's really your own pocket and so that that isolation of saying okay the rules are different i have to find zero zero stimulus of insulin somewhere in this and it doesn't necessarily translate to all the people around you but especially that chronically insulin resistant patient who's had cycles of on and off weight for many years and realizing that it's going to be a process and not just a quick okay i fasted once and i'm better now <laughs> <laughs> realizing oh no this is going to be a long time yeah. yeah as long as it took to get on it won't take that long to get off that journey of saying oh this is a forever thing and you never say that to somebody at the beginning it's too it's too heavy right who wants to do that it's no fun <laughs> like i'll die thank you <laughs> Well, yeah, and now that we're in the month of February, you know, there's Valentine's Day right around the corner. Mm -hmm. um, and with that is all kinds of, right? you yeah. know, all the little things that you always do 
right chocolate dip strawberry and, <laughs> yeah, yeah i mean you know it's real right, right so yeah it's definitely um altering but in a good way if you can just totally understand that okay this is what's happened inside my body and to get that better right it, it takes, takes some sacrifice right so as you you know one of the things i i did in our family too or and i try to help patients is when you give up food as the comfort what do you think you've replaced it with? Okay. Probably, we have definitely had more family time. Like we've definitely played more cards. We've adopted um, a nice family ritual with a <laughs> board game one Sunday, which that's a ton of fun. Oh. So it's, it's more purposeful time spent together versus, okay, we're gonna have a meal together and then that's how we're going to talk. So you, you focus, you just kind of change your focus on things. Mm -hmm. um, and another thing is I, I feel, I do feel better. So we're, you know, we've joined the gym at the school. And so we've worked out this past Friday. I'm like, okay, this is an interesting way to spend it. But all four of us went and nobody complained, except it was really cold getting outside. <laughs> <laughs> we'll give you that one. Yeah. Especially when you're all sweaty once you're done. Mm -hmm. But that was good. I mean, it, it, so you just find different ways to, to mm -hmm. have an outlet. So week nine brings us to some things have happened that we can almost like say arrival, I think, on some things. And one of the improvements that I, I think is still improved is the blood pressure. Mm -hmm. Why don't you uh, just give a little recap of where we started and then where you're at now? Sure. Started out on two different blood pressure medicines that I was taking. Uh, and... <clears throat> I hadn't been checking my blood pressure <laughs> up until the, you know, moving and all the craziness of home. And so it had probably been a good couple of weeks before I'd really been keeping a good eye on it like I did when I first got here. Right. We were checking it regularly here while I'm, you know, transitioning into keto. And blood pressures are very high. 160s, 170s, over 80s, usually 90s. Yeah. So it was running way up there. Um, and currently, I am down to just a half of one of those tablets. Oh, wow. completely off. That is so big. So yep. three-fourths of the medication is off. Absolutely. And what have the numbers been running? 130s to over 80s. Wow. Yeah, so. I've tried. Like, sometimes I usually will take that half a pill in the morning, and I've tried, you know, says, let's see how this goes throughout the day. And it will get up to about 140s over the higher 80s. So I'm like, and it's not ready yet. Yeah. So. Well, that uh, transition of coming off of blood pressure medicines almost always happens inside a doctor-patient room. But the key that I've learned, because they give you all kinds of scripts on how to start blood pressure medicines, but people don't stop them. I mean, it just isn't, like the chapter for undo isn't there. No, so it's it usually add another one. <laughs> I, I mean, know, so know. like, it's real. So you're like, oh, but when you, just like when you start a medication, uh, I, I've said when I'm stopping medications, uh, the key is they're checking because it doesn't really matter what it is in my office. It matters what it is at your home. And then give it like those four to five days to, to really judge it. So give it a go of stopping all the medications and reminding yourself, because I think this also helps just to kind of frame uh, success, that we probably wouldn't start blood pressure medicines again uh, unless there were that 140s to 150s consistently over that 80s to 90s not one or two times, but really three or four weeks steady. Okay. Give it a few days, so stop and keep track and see where you, yeah, so that's a big moment. Sure, absolutely. Uh, why don't you also tie into uh, how the use or fear of salt mattered in this story? Oh my goodness, yes, because when I started out, you know, even checking just my thumbprint, uh, there is a lot of inflammation there. So in my mind, salt is a no-no, we, we hear that all the time, mm -hmm. you know, decrease your salt intake. Your blood pressure side, decrease your salt intake. So switching that mindset, it took me more than one time hearing it. Yeah. I mean, definitely <laughs> more than one time. <laughs> and then, you know, okay, I'll sip a little bit, but to really incorporate it, um, you really have to step back and evaluate and, you know, say, okay, this is what I'm gonna try and it works. Right. It's just against the norm. Oh my goodness. So how do you get your salt in? Usually I just do it in my water. Yeah? Yeah. That's great. So you do the soul. The soul yeah. water. Mm -hmm. It's a trick. It sounds super goofy. <laughs> Let's dissolve some salt in some water and put it in everything. <laughs> yeah, but it works. It does. And honestly, uh, when you get to the part where they've, they start fasting 
that's where if you haven't figured out soli water, you shouldn't advance to fasting yet. Because had I known that at the beginning, oh, it would have been so much easier. <laughs> it's oh, really, gosh. yeah, it's really like just add it and be good at soli water before you fast. Mm -hmm. Michelle's courage captured my heart. Her role as the leader of her children connected with many parents who've tried their best yet fell short. Instead of giving up, she dove all in. That's true. I found my real motivation for change, for sure. I didn't want my kids to suffer from the American traditions that I had taught them. My parents didn't know any better, but I do now. Tune in next week when Michelle takes her new skills to the highest level of the keto continuum. Be sure to subscribe to tune in your life or your family's life may depend upon it.